Uh, our esteemed panellists are going to step through a sequence of four topics that I'll touch on in a moment. Uh, but I do just want to reiterate Yasmin's point that we very much encourage you to send through your questions via the app and we'll be very keen to work those into the discussion. The sequence that I mentioned, uh, what we have in mind, firstly, we'll look at the key challenges in innovation, and that's challenges faced both by incumbent firms and new entrants, but also by supervisors themselves we're looking to innovate. Uh, secondly, we'll touch on regulators' key focus areas, what keeps them up at night about the new world that we find ourselves in now. Thirdly, we'll look at sandboxes, including the GFIN innovation, which the Abu Dhabi global market and the MAS have both been very much leaders in promoting uh, and, and mobilising around the world. And fourthly, we'll look at future regulatory structures and the extent to which the structures and arrangements we have in place, whether they're fit for purpose for what is a very evolving and dynamic area. Before we leap into those, though, I'm going to go across the panel and, and ask the, the three panellists each to introduce themselves. Uh, and taking that last point about the, the future regulatory frameworks, I might get them each to touch on the respective different models of being an integrated regulator that they each have. Uh, as well as also telling us what's their number one priority in the innovation and disruption space. So, Marius, let's start with you. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Marius Turgilas. I'm a board member of the Bank of Lithuania, which is an integrated financial market regulator in Lithuania, which is a member of the European Union and a member of the Eurozone. And um, I guess uh, that would be a short introduction for me, and I guess we have a, an opportunity to talk about that more later. Okay, Marek? Marek Szanowski from Polish FSA, Financial Supervision Authority called KNF. Uh, we are especially interested in uh, supervisory technologies, in improving our regulatory framework, and we're a uh, single uh, regulator. We're doing uh, ins uh, insurance, uh, banking, and, and, and capital markets uh, under one roof. Hi, I'm Richard Ting from Abu Dhabi Global Market. It is a very new international financial center. We celebrated our third year anniversary last month, but we have been transforming the financial services sector in the Middle East and Africa region and awarded Financial Center of the Year for each of the last three years since we went live. So let's start with the, the key challenges in mobilizing innovation. And I want to be broad in this scope here, considering the challenges both for incumbents and for new entrants and for, for supervisors themselves. Uh, at the risk of uh, leading the witnesses a little here, I want to throw out a few candidate areas and, and particularly if I pick up that at the IIF we've recently run a couple of studies on the adoption of machine learning by banks and insurers both in credit risk and in combating money laundering. And we've seen in that different challenges emerge for different cohorts or for different areas of application. But the two persistent challenges we saw repeatedly across all areas of maturity were about data and about people. And in the case of, of data, the challenge of getting all, all the data into one single data lake, uh, the challenges of getting quality data, the challenges of being able to analyse that data. And in people, a bit about the war for talent, that there is perhaps a scarcity of the skills, not only for techniques like machine learning, but also for getting the infrastructure in place ready to run and support those. Uh, another challenge I often hear about uh, regulatory requirements about third party vendors. And we hear this both from banks and also from some of the, the new startups that are looking to partner with banks, that sometimes those requirements are geared more to traditional types of vendors rather than the ones that we see now. So just throwing those out as a few candidate items, I'm sure there are a lot of other challenges beyond those as well. But if I could start with you, Richard, what do you see as being the, the real top challenges in mobilising innovation? Well, I do think that one of the key challenges facing the financial service sector in terms of innovation is how to connect the traditional financial institutions with traditional mindset, with the fintech innovators. How do you adopt those solutions? I think that's one key challenge. The other key challenge, and I, I, I go around the world quite a fair bit talking to different stakeholders, is really how do you change regulations that is formulated during the analog era that's ready for the digital era and how do you future-proof all these regulations to make sure they are fit for purpose, they are allowing innovation to take place, and allowing transformation, technology and services to be offered to the marketplace. Uh, there's a lot of angst and anxiety and frustration if you talk to stakeholders globally. So you have different regulators with different business models, you have some jurisdiction with uh, not only federal regulators but also state regulators, and that makes it very difficult 
for fintech innovators to come to the marketplace in terms of innovation. It makes very good business for, for lawyers to try to navigate those marketplaces. But it's extremely painful for both the fintech innovators as well as the traditional financial services firms. Marek, how about you? What do you see as the top challenges? Well, our idea is to create an uh, optimal ecosystem, so to, to join clients, uh, companies and uh, regulators. And uh, from my perspective, regulatory framework is something that is uh, of crucial importance. And we see that, that uh, those inefficiencies that are, that are in the system, they, they're mainly because of lack of, of optimal regulatory framework. And we're trying to, fo to provide that to the market because we have, of course, uh, uh, well-educated clients, well-educated uh, employees of fintech sector. Uh, we have capital, but we, we have to, to, be, uh, to compete in, in case of a regulatory framework, and that's what we're focusing on. So I'm glad you bring up competition, because, Marius, as I turn to you, I, I want to give you this question in two parts. You know, firstly, that same sense of, of what are the top, uh, top challenges and barriers to innovation, but also, you know, I guess what you're looking for innovation to do. And I know you've, you've talked previously about wanting to, to help promote the level of competition in your market in Lithuania. So what do you see as the top challenges and how do you relate that to the, the competition dynamic in the market? Thank you. I think it's a very wonderful question. Uh, what kind of thing are we discussing here today? We're discussing innovation. Who's on stage? Regulators, besides the, the chairman of, uh, of a discussion. What can regulators say about innovation? Or why do we care about innovation? Well, because Innovation doesn't happen by itself if uh, there is no reason for it to take place. Let me give you a very specific example from a country where I'm coming from, Lithuania. Lithuania is a very has a very concentrated financial market with just a few market players. And it's very efficient. Uh, the banks are earning a very good return. If you look at the performance indicators, cost to income is the lowest in the region. Everything what a supervisor, which we are, should be happy about. Healthy banking system, profitable, efficient. What else? Why do we want innovation? Well, then we noticed that uh, the services that uh, are being introduced in other countries, innovations, are not being in introduced into our financial market because the incumbents, they don't feel any competitive pressure. Because let's be honest, innovation is an expense. And a market player will not innovate if it has no reason to do that. So the job of a regulator is to create this competitive pressure, the, the pressure of someone uh, willing to contest your market, so that uh, incumbents feel pressure to innovate. So in some sense, I'm looking into a room where we have uh, these big elephants. And the hands of regulator you know, are as big as of a human being. I cannot push the elephant. I, you know, I'm not a... Uh, the legislator. You know, I'm, I'm operating in, a, in my mandate. So the best thing I can do, I can open the door and I can let in the flies. And the flies are really irritating. And if the elephants are not moving, they'll be eaten by the flies. And from a regulatory perspective, I don't care. What I care about is for good, reliable, fast, cheap services being provided to the consumers in my society. So that's the attitude that I have. I, I won't quite characterize them as flies. I would say they're more like bees uh, trying to pollinate new, new seeds into new areas. Well, yes, it's a, you know, it's a metaphor. <laughs> the flies can turn into butterflies. <laughs> the, uh, the bee analogy might be more appropriate, but having grown up in the Australian desert, the, uh, the scenario of blowflies is one I can relate to more easily. Um, Maurice, you've given me a very nice segue to our second topic, you, where you posed the question of, of why do we care about innovation? And I wanted to ask uh, across you know, three esteemed regulators from slightly different models and markets here, what are the areas that regulators most care about in this space? What are your focus areas and perhaps what keeps you up at night? And again, I'm, I'm just going to throw out some candidate items here. You know, again, you know, one might be the, the migration of key economic activity outside of the regulatory perimeter. Uh, the potential concentration that we might see where big tech firms become the, the dominant players in certain markets. Concentration in a different way perhaps where a lot of the sector ends up relying on a small handful of cloud service providers. Uh, the emergence of cyber risk is another. 
uh, threats to the ongoing viability of, of particular business models. There's those and there's probably a lot of other things, but I'm curious as to, again, if we can go across the panel as to, to each of you, what you see as being the, the issues that you're most concerned about. Um, perhaps, Marek, we'll start with you this time. Thank you. My main point of interest is security, because without security you have no credibility in the system. And we know that we supervise the system with, over, with, with for, for, uh, 40 million of people. So we have well-capitalized banks, uh, and we have also startups, we have small fintechs. And we don't want to, uh, any of those, uh, of those fintechs or those banks or those entities to, to provide services that are not secure. Because if you'll find this, this uh, wrong, uh, one wrong solution, one, one uh, scam, you will contain the whole uh, ecosystem. So we're trying to, to provide one thing to the system. And it's, uh, it's the thing that, that uh, keeps me awake in the night. It's the security. And we put security first. Yeah. Richard, how about you? Well, I, I think we wear two hats. The first hat we wear is that of a regulatory hat. And the second that we wear is that of an ecosystem developer. Because in that part of town, why do we do what we do? We embrace fintech, we embrace fintech innovation very early on in our journey. And the reason why we do that is if you took, take a scan of the region, of the Middle East and Africa region, it's a big continent, big demographics growth in the next couple of decades, uh, rising needs. But 86% of the adult population is unbanked, underbanked, underserved. So that, there are huge opportunities to be tapped in terms of financial inclusion. If you look at the SME sector, lending to that sector is way beyond global norms. It's 50% beyond that, below that of global median. So IFC has estimated about 260 billion in terms of funding gap for the SME sector in that region. So if you can plug all these issues, bring about greater liquidity, funding pools for SME, you can bring about a different dimension of growth for the region. And we want to bring much more financial activities back into the region, even though there's a number of financial centers in that region, still financial activities are being exported. So the way we go about doing it when we started our journey is we need to be inclusive. We need to bring about all these new technology solutions, new thinking, new dimension to really transform the financial services sector. Um, so we embrace that, not only in terms of our rules and regulations, we are not encumbered by a lot of legacy issues, legacy regulations, and we can formulate regulations really from ground zero that's adapted to market needs. So we have come out with our guidance on things like ICOs and cryptos, we are the first in the region to come up with a crypto sport framework for crypto sport exchanges. And ours is not the race to the bottom, it's racing to the top. It's very comprehensive, uh, covering not only the traditional AML, KYC risk, but also custody risk. Every time coins get stolen or lost, it's going to impact that sector. Covering technology governance risk, uh, market operation risk, uh, of, and of course, investor protection. So in our conversation with institutions, they are not willing to participate in that sector without all this risk being addressed. And as long as the institutions don't come in, you're going to see a lot of price volatility in that particular asset class. Because for any asset class which is predominantly retail and sophisticated investors, you have that challenge. We, I can go on to ecosystem development much later, but we are doing quite a fair bit on the ecosystem development side. Uh, I just rushed here from the launch of API Exchange with Singapore. So I'm happy to talk about that later. Richard, if I can ask you one follow-up. You, you mentioned AML and KYC in the comments you just made. And, and certainly we found in the, the interviews we did of 60 firms recently, the, the MENA region, was, we found very much a leader in adopting machine learning and technological innovation in finding more efficient ways to do, do AML, uh, AML uh, combating, for instance. Um, interested in your thoughts here. One of the, the impressions I think we landed on was that there is the, the challenge of the, uh, I guess, the limitation of, of data sharing, of information sharing both across firms or between firms and the, the, the public sector. In some cases, even restrictions on the ability to share information about attacks or threats within a firm where it spans borders. And so technology is probably helping to give some uplift in combating AML and detecting fraud, but could probably give us a much bigger uplift if we were able to improve information sharing have a feedback loop from law enforcement. 
yeah, just interested in any impressions you have on that topic. Yeah, so on that front, um, let me just then move very quickly into what we do on the ecosystem development front and I can address that question. I, I, we found that a lot of all this shared utility, it makes a lot of sense for the regulator to be in the center. So we are working with Abu Dhabi financial institutions, the banks, the remittance houses, the payment providers to come out with an electronic know your customer regime. And when we found that you leave it to the private sector, the banks coming together, they don't quite trust whether I can, once you onboard a customer, can I trust whatever your onboarding process is? So they want the comfort of a regulator standing in the middle to make sure that the standards are common, the standards are here to, to make sure that you have that shared utility for the greater common good, reducing the cost of compliance, bring about common standards, AML issues that you mentioned, even data residency issue, which is important. How do you share data across financial institutions? How do you share data across borders, which is a bigger problem, right? So we find that if a regulator is active in the middle participating in that, many of the private sector financial institutions gain comfort in that. So we, we did the EKYC, uh, we are doing the trade finance platform that Singapore and Hong Kong are doing, the Global Trade Connectivity Network, again participating in that using blockchain technology, trying to bring about greater trade flows between Asia Pacific, Middle East and Africa region. I mentioned the digital sandbox that we are doing. So API Exchange uh, is a brainchild of MES and AFIN the ASEAN Financial Innovation Network, building a digital sandbox and building a digital marketplace for financial institutions in this region and fintech innovators to come together in a marketplace to source for products, services, to innovate. We are doing something similar in Middle East and Africa, building a digital sandbox. Our partners are here, Alpha. We are working with Singapore in terms of national trade payment. Some of the partners are here. And we're doing that for Middle East and Africa and linking the two continents, making it more powerful, much bigger economic blocks, allowing for more innovation to take place. So we'll pick up the topic of sandboxes and international coordination of that further in just a moment. But before we do, Marius, I'd like to get your views here. I think you've already touched on the aspiration of helping to promote competition in the market, but, but whether uh, you want to elaborate further on that and, and what open banking can bring. Or, or indeed other focus areas that, that you as a supervisor see? Yes, I want to bring uh, to the attention of the audience here one very specific uh, initiative, and that is, again, coming from the people in power. And these are usually the politicians. So in Europe, the European Parliament decided that we need to disrupt the financial system as we know it in, in Europe. And uh, that goes under the code name of open banking, or otherwise also known as a payment services directive version two, which really introduced new market players into the financial system. As we know, the, you know, usually the financial infrastructure is being run by the central banks. And if you want to be connected in any way to the financial market, you want to be doing payments, insurance, uh, asset management, you need to be plugged in. In some sense, you need to have a, a socket and uh, someone who is plugging into the electricity of the financial system. And well, the way we design the financial system around the world, only the selected few, the gentleman club, have access to that financial system, and that is the banking community. So the European Parliament said, well, we need to allow more players to enter this financial market. And that's how we created the, the institutions called uh, electronic money institutions, which are safeguarding the funds and allowing very mundane transaction type of business to take place. But again, nothing was happening because the banks, they found the reason why they do not provide electricity or the accounting services to those institutions. Then there was a regulatory reaction again from the people in power, saying, well, guess what? Now you have to have access. You need to provide access. And in Europe, all those third-party companies called electronic money institutions and uh, payment providers, they now have two types of services. One is called account information service, or the right of a third party to connect to a banking infrastructure and to source all the client data 
which the bank has built over many, many years, and to utilize it for innovation. Another one is called payment initi initiation service, but that's probably, we're not going to finish on time here if we start talking about that. <laughs> but the point yes. is that all of a sudden, being big is not an advantage. Being big means you are a big target. Anyone can now connect into your API, which you have to provide by law, which you have to provide by law in a very specific way, and I all of a sudden can leverage on that. And that's opening up competition. That is opening up innovation. So I think open banking offers a lot of great opportunities for, in terms of cu customer empowerment as well as competition, but it does have a few key design considerations, and, and one of those is perhaps around the, the symmetry or otherwise between participants. Uh, and I guess there's the, the scenario where you could have a big tech firm that has a lot of data on a particular customer from other non-financial areas, and they're able to access banking data via an open banking arrangement, put all of that together and run their algorithms in a way that nobody else can. Do you think there should be a mechanism there where, where customers are able to direct other areas outside of purely banks to be able to participate in that ecosystem, sharing data, providing customer data as well as being recipients of it? Uh, we had Scott Farrell speak at an event recently on his report he wrote for the Australian Government, which is very much an open data ecosystem in which telcos and, uh, and electricity providers beyond just banks will be subject to this. Do you see that as being something that needs to ultimately evolve and become a, a broader open data ecosystem beyond merely banking? So we regul regulators, we like this uh, you know, equal treatment uh, standard for everyone. So if you're in the business of providing a particular vertical of service, it doesn't really matter, are you a telco, are you a third party, are you an incumbent bank? It doesn't really matter. Everyone should be facing the same regulatory framework. Mm -hmm. And that applies to GAFAs uh, or any other one who is willing to enter this particular, particular market. Yep. To your point that uh, you know, they have a, a better advantage in terms of uh, accessing bigger pools of data and they can analyze them and you know, gain a competitive advantage com compared to others. Well, again, it is the job of uh, legislators and together with regulators to ensure that everyone has the equal right or access to the same level of data. And this is the reason, in my personal opinion, others can disagree, why companies like, I'm not going to mention the big names, but you know, social media companies, they are not entering the, the financial services space as of yet, because they understand the second they enter, they enter my perimeter and they will be regulated in the same way. How regulated? They'll be forced up to open up their, the data source like the banks are forced to open up right now. So this is uh, kind of the threat towards them. Sure. And, um, you know, regulators always uh, find a way to, to regulate uh, unregulated uh, financial market players. Like what the PBOC did with a closed loop, uh, you know, electronic money companies like WeChat and uh, Alipay. All of a sudden, all transactions right now are being processed through the central bank. And all, all of a second, instead of in being a closed loop, it's uh, going through the central bank. It's just regulatory intervention. Please. Well, there's also one thing important, that we have still this regulatory arbitrage, and we have over 100 of regulators all over the world, and they provide different standards to the, to the companies that are on the market right now. So if you're big, you have to comply with all those uh, regulations, yeah, to be, to be, to be active on, on that market. And from my perspective, it is very important to create global standards and to create global cooperation uh, between uh, supervisors in order to uh, not not to allow this regulatory arbitrage we have some 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 smaller countries that don't have uh, uh, tens of, of millions or hundreds of millions of, of uh, uh, inhabitants and uh, sometimes they they they're licensing uh, fintechs that are not uh, that they're target is not the, the country uh, where they obtain the license, but the countries surrounding this country or, or <laughs> fintechs uh, acting globally. And from my perspective, from the regulator that is mainly focused on the security, I'm a little bit aware of that regulatory arbitrage. And I, I would like to see more global standards, and I feel that those global standards, they, they will provide us better environment for fintech uh, globally. 
Just a reminder again about submitting questions through the app. We very much encourage you to do that. We've got a number of questions coming through already, quite a lot of whom which relate to the, the final topic we'll get to, one that relates to data sharing that we've just touched on. But I'll just introduce one other question we had, which is how can different regulators within a certain jurisdiction collaborate efficiently to help build a one-stop shop for fintechs to be able to, to benefit from? Uh, uh, let's, yeah, if you'd like to start on that, Maurice, yeah. So, you know, you are, you are not an innovative regulator right now if you don't run a regulatory sandbox. But what does that really, really mean, right? You cannot bend the rules. Uh, you cannot, you know, not apply the regulatory standard that everyone expects from you because, you know, then you are not doing your job. But just to give a very concrete example, uh, financial services are moving into more like technologically involved uh, element more data being used. We talk about, uh, like my colleague here, about the blockchain technology. Um, what does it mean if you want to engage in financial services based on blockchain technology? Let's say you want to build a, a new standard of distributing insurance policies, uh, uh, running smart contracts on a public blockchain. Well, to me as a regulator, it's a nightmare. Hold your thought. It's a nightmare. Why is that? Because what these evangelists are saying to me, they're saying public blockchain is immutable. Once you put things there, it's forever. Great. So if you design your product, you let it go, and next day you realize your IT people run to you and say, we made a mistake. The contract will self-execute and disappear, and all the money of the consumers will be gone. This is something which I'm not willing to accept as a supervisor. Mm -hmm. But I'm able to facilitate. That's why Bank of Lithuania is building a technological sandbox together with IBM and Deloitte to ensure that innovative solutions are being tested before they are put into the public space. And this is something that which we need to collaborate on. So going back to your question, it's not only the supervisor, the regulator which is involved in innovation. If you talk about data, what about the data protection agencies? So the collaboration needs to happen not only across the supervisors in different jurisdictions, but within the country on different layers, competition authority, data protection agencies, monetary policy authority as well, in terms of provision of uh, monetary policy access. So perhaps you mentioned sandboxes there, which is a really good segue to our next topic. And I was going to turn to Richard here. And, and Richard, you may want to elaborate on that point as, as well. But you know, with sandboxes, I think it's worth referring to the, the GFIN, the Global Financial Innovation Network, uh, which was set out in a proposal involving 12 agencies, including the, the Abu Dhabi Global Market, as well as the Monetary Authority of Singapore and the Financial Conduct Authority of the, the UK. You know, I think those, those three agencies collectively have probably been the, the most active leaders in promoting this. And I was wondering, Richard, if you could perhaps tell us a little bit about the, the benefits of the GFIN and, uh, and the, the rationale for a global sandbox in addition to what you might want to add on the, the broader question we've just been on. So I, I just wanted to touch on the previous question that you have. Because if you look at, if you study the different jurisdiction around the world, in jurisdiction where you have different regulators, you have your banking, insurance, securities regulator, or you have your prudential versus market conduct regulator, and added to that complexity, you have some countries which federal regulators are responsible for things like such as banking and payments, but state regulators are responsible for securities law and insurance law, for instance. When you have all this mixture, it leads to a lot of complexity in terms of coordination among the regulators in terms of what's the approach to take on fintech. How do we support fintech? How do we support innovation? I've not seen, I mean, I've seen people, jurisdiction make positive vibes. We have set up innovation office to try to coordinate among the different regulators. But I've not quite seen a very effective model where the countries has multiple jurisdiction, where all the regulators can come together and look across the financial services sector to say some of these new models are coming through, impacts more than one sector that we are regulating and we need to coordinate quite closely with other regulators. So I've not really seen that. Uh, in some jurisdiction where you have multiple regulators, you have not seen sandboxes like you mentioned because nobody can agree uh, who is responsible for the sandbox. 
if this sandbox come about, let's say there are different business models, let's say a banking model is coming in that's trying to disrupt banking. But I, as a regulator, am not responsible for that. What do I do with that? So there are a multitude of questions. So we are, we are possibly going to see some changes in the regulatory landscape going forward to bring about closer, tighter coordination, closer, tighter col collaboration between the regulators. So then let me move on to your GFIN question. Uh, again, it is something to allow for closer cooperation, not only for regulators within one jurisdiction, which is extremely important to support innovation, but cross-border. So how that proposal came about, uh, UK FCA, a close partners of ours, they were thinking about, they have a lot of fintech bridges, right? Uh, people keep approaching them to say, can we sign a fintech MOU? Uh, I think they, they sort of get quite frustrated by all the requests. And they say, let's do something where we have a global platform of regulators working together. Each of you have your sandbox. Let's say a participant in one sandbox wants to bring the products and services across border. How do we facilitate that? But obviously, a consultation paper was issued and it has morphed into something different to go beyond sandboxes. It allows for a platform, a structured platform, where regulators can come together, share experiences, share common pain points, learning lessons, and explore possibilities. Possibilities like the one I mentioned just now, the API exchange that Singapore has launched under the ASEAN Financial Innovation Network and Abu Dhabi doing the digital sandbox for Middle East and Africa, coming together the link on that. Sharing experience on what works for shared utilities such as EKYC. But beyond that, it allows for a, a structured platform in which industry participants, the fintech innovators, can really work together, collaborate, hold discussions with global regulators, on a similar platform. So by now we have about 12 members in GFIN and we are looking to work across different jurisdictions. So I want to pick up that last point you made around the you know, hopefully getting beyond the 12 members. Uh, when the GFIN consultation was open, uh, it was open for comment until October 14 and at the IIF we, you know, we were certainly very supportive of the initiative but one of the things we called out was that we would like to see it widened to include more jurisdictions, more agencies not least to ensure that there is, a, I guess, a parity of, of access across the world. Can you update us at all in terms of the, the outlook and the status of, of GFIN uh, beyond that consultation that closed a, a month ago? So the, there's a key group that's looking into various areas. Um, at a Hong Kong FinTech Summit that was just preceded before this Singapore FinTech Summit, there was a discussion about next steps in terms of governance, in terms of cooperation. But I think some of those different tracks of work will come into play uh, subsequently. But really, some of the regulators that have signed on to the GFIN network do not have their sandboxes. Mm -hmm. So what they have are term innovation office, uh, cooperation offices. So GFIN really goes beyond sandboxes at this point in time. It allows for greater collaboration among regulators. But we, we need to be mindful not to have a duplicate of what ISCO is doing, the International Organization of Securities Commissions, on that front because there's a fintech agenda in there as well. But GFIN goes beyond securities regulator, which is a good thing. Uh, so it allows for greater collaboration across the different subsectors of financial services. And as you say, Richard, it's, it's broader than just the, the issue of sandboxes. Uh, but I think it's probably worth touching on sandboxes more broadly, including with our, our other agencies here that are, are not part of the GFIN. Uh, Marius, do you have a view in terms of the role of sandboxes and the, the value of those? I really think it is really conducive to financial innovation and uh, let me substantiate that. It's not only words. Uh, the biggest difficulty for the, which I faced uh, coming into this financial market supervisor uh, job was to change the, the attitude or the, the way regulators approach any innovation. Any innovation is, is a risk. Let's face it. And it just goes against the grain of supervisor to accept it, you know, because the job of supervisor used to be like a good policeman, you know. The best way to stop uh, accidents on the roads is to, you know, stop the cars driving. But it's not really conducive to 
you know, traffic jams and other things. It's the old notion that every ship is exactly. safe, safe in a harbour, but do you so really how, want them? How, how do we, how do we change that? So recently, Bank of Lithuania was awarded a, um, an award for, for being a, a catalyst for financial innovation. And I, then I accepted that award. I said, you know, you got it wrong, completely wrong. What is a catalyst? A catalyst is a, it's an element which, you know, speeds up the chemical reaction without changing itself. It's completely wrong. The most important thing is about changing the supervisory approach to financial innovations. And that is what is happening around the world. You might ask, why is that, why is that happening? Because the regulators are being forced to do that. Because if we don't do that, the, you know, the regulated uh, entities are escaping us. Everything is moving into unregulated sphere. And we are chasing it back in a good sense. So, you know, it's a, it's a distress, and distress is really, really motivating. You know, why we're thinking of uh, new ways of uh, making payments happen uh, across the jurisdictions? Because there are other alternatives right now. So this is what brings us to regulatory sandboxes. Why we want them? We want things to be developed in front of us so that we are a bit safe, but we want it to, to be happening. So one is a regulatory sandbox, which is uh, uh, a way you know you allow firms to innovate in a regulated sphere. Another one, which I mentioned before, is the technological sandbox, which is the ability to facilitate technological innovation from a regulatory perspective. Let's not forget there are other risks besides uh, credit risk, operational risk. You know, then things just shut down. Because yes. the consumers right now are being used to having everything immediately right here. And the things, if the button doesn't work, you know, they, they are panicking. What if payments stop for 24 hours? What then? So we need to make sure that, you know, cybersecurity is also taken into consideration. And that's why I think mm -hmm. sandboxes are important. So I think I want to so work in. Can I just add to that? Yeah, I do think that sandboxes are the foundation of regulators right. trying to embrace innovation. I think it's important on that front. Uh, by now, our sandbox has 26 players in there coming from around the world. We have 80 applications around the world coming to our sandbox, uh, second most active globally. But it allows the regulator to work up front very closely with the fintech innovators to understand the possible benefits as well as the risks. It allows us to know the deficiencies in our own skill sets and try to acquire those if those skill sets to understand the business model much better. So it's upfront and personal, we're very, working very closely and benefiting by working closely with the fintech innovators. Marika, I'll let you comment and I'll just forewarn the panel now. I'm going to throw in one of the other audience questions after Marek's comment. Um, I think picking up this point that, that Marius has just made about the role as a catalyst, I've got a, I've got a great question. How can a regulator build an incentive scheme for innovation? It's a challenging problem. What's your experience with that? Um, perhaps there's a question as to whether it is the regulator's role to build an incentive scheme. So I'll give you the notice for a moment to, to ponder that question. But firstly, Marek. Well, I would like to share opinion of my colleagues <laughs> that, that uh, actually uh, by starting uh, uh, FinTech department, we started dialogue within the uh, Financial Supervision Authority. Because uh, before that, prior that, we were focused on security. Mm -hmm. yep. And now we're going from this safe platform to, to dialogue. We're still in a safe place. I mean, the majority of my employees are taking care of, of safety or security. But there's also a group of people that's, that's developing our sandbox, our innovation hub, our uh, innovation lab that, that we established. So this is, some, some, this is special special force in, in every... Uh, in every regulatory uh, uh, or supervisory entity that is taking care of innovation because innovation is, is main uh, point of our uh, today's meeting. So in order to boost innovation, you have to create special group of people that will take care of that and they will compete with, with other employees. That's something we, we see at, uh, at Polish KNF. Marius, now that I've given you a moment to, to ponder, did you want to take that question about the incentive scheme? Yeah, I think I can do that. Incentives. I think we need to devise a, um, a playing ground 
which is conducive to failure. And this is coming from the regulator. Failures must take place because otherwise there will be no innovation. But what we need to ensure that those failures do not throw the system, does not put us into systemic risks, or do not displace the regulator in any other way. Don't forget the political risks, you know. No, now we are protected by our independence mandates and things like that. But once we engage in very innovative activity and then it touches the nerve of some politician, all of a sudden, you know, the regulators can turn into very backwards institutions. And this is something with which we need to protect. So when we, when we do what we do, it's not because regulators are stupid or they're not innovative enough. It's because we have a different perspective. We have a perspective of a society in front of us, not only the, the particular business model that uh, everyone is talking about. So that is why it's um, providing incentives. It's to provide the environment where failures can take place in a safe way. Can I just use one minute to touch on that incentive? I don't think it's a right question for regulators. It is the right question for policymakers and legislators. Because if you look at the different stages of life cycle of fintech startup, you have startup stage, which you are looking for different things. You are looking for possibly incentive and grants to start up. When, when you move to the incubation stage, right, you are looking for people that can help you grow and scale very quickly. Right? So on that, you might not be looking at the same sort of financial incentive, but you are looking for partners. You are looking for people that can help you grow. You are looking for mentors. Once you grow to a certain stage, you are looking for scalability in terms of how do you deploy, how do you have adoption of your technology. So at different stages of the life cycle of a fintech, what you need is quite different. And that should be in the national agenda. Uh, and the national agenda should quite rightly include how do you make sure, how do the policy makers and legislators make sure that the regulator are tasked properly to make sure that they're equipped with the right skill sets, have adequate funding to support innovation in their mandate, to support competition into their mandate. And those are really national issues, policy making issues, and legislative issues to think about. Marius, a quick comment, and then we'll go to our last quick, topic. Quick comment. We need to reduce the entry barriers. We need to identify them. What are they? Is it the technological one? Is it the financial infrastructure, access to the central bank payment system? We need to reduce that. And once the entry happens, innovation will take place. And then we don't need to do anything about that. We don't need, you know, we are, we are not the innovators ourselves. Uh, so having innovation departments at the central bank, like understanding what's happening in the, in the industry is great, but we will not create the products. It's very bad if regulators start creating products. It's about facilitating. And how do we do that? Well, I saw many startup companies here. They have VC capital behind them. If it takes for them one year, two years to enter into the market because the regulator you know, is just dragging and dragging and dragging, they're burning capital. So we need to streamline our processes to make sure that you know, license issuing is effective so that if everything is in order, in three months you are servicing the customers and not burning investors' capital. So we'll turn now to our, our final topic and we'll quickly go across the panel and probably get a, a two minute comment or so from each. Um, within this, I'll embed the, uh, the audience question we've had about how regulators co can cope with the pace of change. And indeed, if we turn to this topic now of, of regulatory frameworks and whether they're fit for purpose in the new world, you know, there's two anecdotes or data points I wanted to touch on. One is about the pace of change that we've seen in China, for instance, and where uh, Ant Financial and, uh, uh, and Tencent between them have virtually overnight achieved 93% market share in a $5.5 trillion mobile payments business which I think makes the point that when innovation happens, it can happen very quickly, and it's a challenge for perhaps the, the wheels of regulatory and legislative change to keep up. But the other is about our structures in the sense that I think we've been served quite well over the years with a fit for purpose approach where bank supervisors looked after banks, insurance supervisors looked after insurers. And now we're in a world where a lot of those traditional silos, the lines are blurred, we have new entrants, new entity types, and new services that cut across those traditional dimensions. Um, and one, one experience I've had certainly is in talking about open banking and the, the point that uh, Marius made earlier. 
we'd go and talk to a banking supervisor who'd say, well, this is actually broader than just banking. We need to take that up to the Ministry of Finance. And we'd have other finance ministries who'd say, well, that's really a banking issue. You need to be talking to the banking supervisor. And I don't think it's that anyone's trying to duck the issue. It's that we're all learning in this space and it's a space that's still evolving. So if I can go across the panel and, and perhaps we'll, we'll start with Marek. Your views on, on how the regulatory frameworks we have, whether they're, they're suitable or whether they need to evolve with the more dynamic environment that we now have. Well, in this dynamic environment, we should... Uh, well, th there are two approaches. One of them is that we should specialise, but I'm, I'm uh, more uh, close to this approach that we should uh, coordinate uh, supervisory authorities. We're, we're joint supervision, so we supervise all the entities that are on the market, and we see that we can learn by doing. We can learn other units at uh, FSA, to, to take uh, to, to acquire experience from those who are working in the capital market, those from banking sector, they're, they're learning how to use, for example, machine learning or artificial intelligence or biometry from their colleagues uh, uh, from, from insurance uh, departments. So when you're going to licensing, uh, no matter if you're, you're, you're giving license for a bank or for a a fintech or for an insurance company, you have some, some set of skills. If you don't have this set of skills, you can acquire it but by asking your colleague that is sitting next to you or, or a couple of de desks uh, uh, farther. So my, uh, in, in my, my point of view is that, that we should uh, have joint supervision authorities, uh, especially as this one is at Lithu in Lithuania, when you have micro supervision, macro super, supervision, resolution authority in, in one uh, building when you can learn by doing. And it's something that is of crucial importance. Yeah, sure. Uh, Maris. Yes. So how do we adapt regulatory frameworks? Again, case study. We didn't touch on it probably because it's the regulators, you know, crypto assets. Lots of issues from consumer protection perspective, investor protection, whatever. But it really is interesting, specifically in those markets where we have very shallow liquidity in the financial markets, and that is something which we need maybe to develop. But how do you interconnect it with the current regulatory framework? If we all of a sudden start issuing seriously about security tokens being issued, well, the current legislation requires all securities to be registered in the depositorium. But if it is on the public ledger, why does it have to be? But then the incumbents say, well, why do you apply this regulation to me and they, they are exempt? So this interconnectivity between the current regulatory framework and these innovations which usually make those frameworks obsolete uh, is something which we need to be working on. That's part of moving beyond being entities focused and more focused on the activity and the, the risk, isn't it? So the best approach is you know, to start small and again, leveraging on what we said before, regulatory sandbox. You know, you, you have exchange, you have a depositorium, some innovative guys work together with the oversight of a supervisor and then convince us. And then we take it to the legislators and we change the legislative framework, then, you know, that's innovation. And that's the proper way to do stuff. Not bending innovation, not going around it, but changing it. I would say that what you see in China, you won't see it replicated in the Western Hemisphere or large part of the world. You will see it in new, some new jurisdiction in let's say Middle East and Africa. Why is that the case? If you look at the Western Hemisphere, the rules and regulations are entrenched, the regulators are entrenched, it's very difficult. I think the first priority for them is really to look at how do you change the rules and regulations to make sure they are digital age ready, future ready, right? So the, do the tech dominant world that you see in China is very difficult to replicate that into the Western Hemisphere, which I believe if you look forward, you'll still be either in a bank dominant world or a complementary bank do complementing the fintechs or the fintechs complementing the banks and financial institutions because the things are too entrenched, the cultural norms are too entrenched. People will have a certain view of what the bank looked like, unlike what in China in terms of payment service providers. So those are, those are things that are difficult to overcome. Well, look, we've hit full time. Just as we conclude the conversation, I thought I'll just call out a couple of the top takeaways I've taken from each of the panellists. Um, Richard, I really like the point you made about the, the challenge of connecting tr traditional firms and their traditional mindsets 
to what's needed with, you know, for, or, or I guess to the, the more dynamic approach that you might see from a fintech startup. And also your point about the regulation from the analog era and how that needs to adapt and evolve with the conditions that we face. Um, Marika, I really like the point you, you reiterated again that, that the top priority is about security. And I guess in that security is multifaceted. It's not just the technical and the cyber sense, but it's inherently about how we protect the customer. Uh, and that takes on many different forms. And Marius, I, I like the points you made firstly that any, any innovation is a risk and how that naturally goes against the grain for a supervisor. I also really like the point you made that innovation needs to have, uh, I guess, a playing ground that is conducive for failure. I thought that was a really interesting point you made, that it needs to be conducive for failure, but at the same time, a supervisor's view of wanting to ensure that such a failure is not systemic or, or have a wider impact on the confidence throughout the market. So three great, uh, three great contributions from our panellists. Please join me in, in thanking Richard, Marek and Marius.